Praise God. You might be seated. Take your Bibles and turn with me to 2 Corinthians. And while you do that, if the ushers would come, uh, we'll give you an opportunity to bless the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 is where we're headed. Um, just quick announcements. I uh, want to remind you, uh, Friday night is fish fry. Okay, I just want to see if you're listening. Friday night is a fish fry. We could use your help. Uh, if you could come and be here and, you know, if they need you in the kitchen, great. If they don't need you in the kitchen, we'll use you out there in other parts of greeting and welcoming and loving on our guests and visitors that are here. Uh, it really means a lot when we have that opportunity to do that. Uh, and, and if you don't mind hanging around to the end, it don't take long to clean up when we got everybody either. So if you could be here, that'd be wonderful. Uh, on on uh, Friday night, also Sunday morning and Sunday night, uh, Alan Griffin's with us. And one other thing I want to mention to you, coming up on the 29th, on the Sunday night, the 29th, we're going to do a beach service. Not the beach boys, but we're going to do a beach service. And what we're going to do is we're going to have uh, refresh hamburgers. The church will provide hamburgers and, and some ice and stuff. Y'all bring the stuff to go with it. We'll do that at 6 o'clock at the pavilion at Peter's Point. And then as soon as we've done that, we're all going to mingle down to the beach. We'll have a, a, a devotion, maybe a couple songs. And then we're going to do water baptism. And so uh, if you know of anybody that needs to be baptized in water, or maybe you do, uh, but we've got a couple already. And so uh, going to be a beach. I mean, I'm excited about that. I think it'll be a great thing on the 29th of, of June. So uh, just kind of giving you a heads up on that one. Amen. Brother Pete, would you ask God's blessing on the giving? <clears throat> Amen. Also, don't forget there is a there is a baby shower Monday night for the WM meeting for Gretchen. I'm believing she's going to be there, and, and it's going to be a great time, okay? So uh, come prepare for that. Praise the Lord. All right. I'm trying to think if there's anything else I need to tell you about. Real important. That's pretty much it. Amen. All right. Uh, we're looking at Chapter 5 tonight. Um, Last week we were in chapter 4 and uh, we, were, we were talking, let me just turn there real quick with you, uh, in chapter 4, we were talking, oops, one too many chapters, got to Galatians, I'm ready to go to Galatians, anybody been there lately? Book of Galatians is a great book. Last week we were talking about having this treasure in jars of clay, how many of you remember that? We had a good time last week. I did. I don't, I don't know about y'all, but I, I enjoy Wednesday nights. I love just teaching the Word and spending time in God's Word. And, and so we talked about how we are just jars of clay. And, and now Paul's going to use another idea as he brings us into chapter 5. And so look at verse 1 in chapter 5. He says, now we know that the earthly tent that we live in is destroyed, if, excuse me, when the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. Anybody ever had one of them dreams? You know what I'm saying, don't you? You got caught without anything on. Come on, anybody ever been? I mean, sir, there are times we, you know, you're, it's a nightmare. It's like you're somewhere you're not supposed to be and, 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 and you can't find your clothes, or you, you know, and everybody's coming and you just, you're fidgeting and, 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 oh, I'm the only one that does that? I'm sorry. I'm telling on myself again. You, you know, uh, yeah, okay, nightmares. It is a nightmare. It's a scary thing. And, and I woke up before like that, and I was just like, you know, 
because I thought I, I was, you know, just getting, I was, I don't know how to explain it, you know, just one of them feelings. And uh, I want you to look at this passage, though, for a minute. Paul, in this verse 2, says, because we are clothed, we will not be found naked. I can't wait till we get to this verse. I'm going to go back to verse 1. But I want you to understand God doesn't intend for the believer to be naked. He has provided for us everything that we have need for. Can I hear an amen? amen. Look with me back at verse 1. Verse 1 says, Now we know that if the earthly tent that we live in is destroyed, Paul looks, how many of you know what Paul's uh, side job was? He was a tent maker. Is it any chance that he would use that terminology, a tent? I mean, when he talks about a tent, anybody been camping lately in a tent? Most people, you know, you don't see a lot of tent campers anymore, especially when you get a little older. I mean, you might have started out that way. But you get a little older and you start going for one of those pop-ups with a hard shell. Maybe it's got a little tent on the side. And, and, and then before long, you're going to one of these ones that's a little travel trailer that's enclosed all the way. Can I hear an amen? And then you move on up and move on up until you, you've kind of upgraded yourself to where you, you know, I grew up and we went out in a tent. I'll never forget the first time I went camping with a the Boy Scouts in our church. I was in the Church of God at that time, and we didn't have Royal Rangers, but we had Boy Scouts. And somebody had given the church their tents when they moved up and upgraded to something else. How many of you know what that tent was like? When you get the leftovers, guess what it's like? I've always said this. I'm going to tell you something. If you're going to give something to God, give him the best. Don't give him your leftover. Don't give him a wore-out tent. Give him the best thing you can. Can I hear an amen? Well, some of you need to learn that lesson. Come on. I was out there in this tent with a bunch of other boys, and we're out there camping, and this is down in Tampa at the Hillsborough River State Park, and we're out there camping, and come one of those flash floods. That tent, leaked more. There was more water on the inside of the tent than there was on the outside. How I many of you know what I'm talking about? Everything I had was drowned. Mama had made me a, a, a sleeping bag. Uh, you know, I had one of those little cheap rafts, you know, that you get for a couple of dollars. And she took my sleeping bag and sewed these little loops around the bottom so when you put the sleeping bag on it, it kind of would stay there and it wouldn't slide off, the, you know, because it had a tendency to want to slide off when you roll over. And so mama fixed me up. She'd take care of me. And I was a mama's boy. Okay. My air mattress went flat. My sleeping bag was wet. All my clothes were wet. That tent had wore out. The stitchings had given up. It was pitiful. Paul understands the idea of a tent is temporary. How many of you understand Tents are temporary. This body, this flesh that we have is temporary. It's not an eternal thing. God has placed inside of these temporary beings something very special. We talked about it in the last chapter, a treasure in earthen vessels. But he calls it a tent in chapter 5. And, and as we look at this, he says, now, if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, how many of you know your earthly body is going to die one day? Right. Scripture declares it's appointed unto man wants to die. Okay? And, and so when we look at that word one more time, look at that fifth word. Now we know that if. How many of you know what the word if is? If this happens, if that happens, if, 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 if. If is a conditional kind of a word, okay? The word if here, Paul uses the word if because he knows that Christ could return at any time. 
Paul was not questioning whether Christ would return or not. He said, if this tent, this body, listen to it. Now, we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, you see, Paul is giving us the indication that he's believing that Jesus may come before this body dies. How many of you believe in the rapture? Man, I'm, I'm holding on to that one. That's one of our fun, fundamental truths there, okay? That's one of the cardinal truths, the rapture. That's the catching out of the church, okay? Trumpet of God is sound. The dead in Christ shall rise first, and those who remain shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. So will be with the Lord forever. Can I hear an amen? amen. I mean, Paul is thinking, I'm not going to die because Jesus said he's coming back. Paul is thinking, I may not die, but if this earthly tent is destroyed, death takes it over. He says, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. You know, that eternal house is a, a heavenly body or, or a dwelling place. It's a place God is preparing for us. How many of you understand what Jesus told the disciples in John chapter 14? He says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. How many of you know Jesus went on ahead of us? He went to prepare this place for us. God is going to give us a new body. Now, I understand that when we die, our spirit goes to be with the Lord. But I want you to understand that there's not a bunch of spirits just floating around up there, but there is some type of a body that God is for us. One day, the body that's in the earth will be reconditioned, remade to where it's perfect, and join our spirit, okay? And there'll be a meeting in the air, come on. But at the same time, God has something for us. An earthly body is here, this tent, but a heavenly body that God has prepared for us is there. So listen to this verse one one more time. He says, now we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house. How many of you know what the word eternal means? Everlasting forever. We have an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. And verse 2 goes on to say, but meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling. Anybody here anxious to get to heaven? I mean, I just remember growing up as a kid, we sang all these songs about, won't it be wonderful there, having no burdens to bear. How many of you are with me? <laughs> I mean, Lillis, what was that one you were singing before church, Lillis? What was that one you were singing before we started? I'm feeling mighty fine. I've got heaven on my mind. Don't you know, don't you know, where the milk and honey flow? I mean, I'm looking forward to a place called heaven. It's a place of spending eternity with my heavenly Father and with my Lord Savior, Jesus Christ. Can you hear amen? amen? You know, he says, meanwhile, while I'm in this tent, while I'm in this fleshly body, God's given it to me. I thank God my, my body's healthy right now. There are some weaknesses in my body. There are some frailments, but, but for the most part, I'm pretty healthy. You know, uh, but... This body is temporary. I know that one day, if the Lord doesn't return, they're going to take this body, and I haven't decided yet if I'm going to let them burn me <laughs> or put me in a casket. I, I've never decided I wanted to get burned yet. <laughs> I have no problem with that. Cremation, I've always decided that cremation is just speeding up the process. I ain't in there anyhow. Are you hearing me? I don't want to be with the Lord. What you saw was a temporary thing. So when I die, if it's cheaper for them to bury me in, a, in an urn somewhere or dig a hole and just throw in the ashes, come on. I, I mean, I have no rituals about this stuff because this thing here is just temporary. It's just something. 
I mean, I don't care what, what you know, I mean, you, you may be very, I don't think that I'm going to go back to the funeral home or to the cemetery and visit all my family and loved ones all the time. Maybe you have that feeling. You like to do that. But I know they're not there. I know they're in heaven. Well, at least the ones that are supposed to be. I feel like that. I hope the rest of them made it. And this body, whether it's in an urn somewhere or it's scattered out under the water in the ocean or whether it's in a casket somewhere in six feet under in some concrete vault or whatever, one day, in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, it's going to be changed. Are you hearing me? You don't think God can bring the dust back together? You, don't, you, you didn't read the book of Ezekiel where he, he called those bones back together? Come on. And he put flesh back on them. He put muscle back on them. And he said, look at that, look at that, that big old army. Can these bones live? Only you know, Lord. We get so caught up on this thing here. This is temporary. If you're lucky, you're 70, 80 years old, the Bible says. Some people go beyond that, and they live into their hundreds now, and that's okay, and we're glad to have you all around. <laughs> but you know what? If the trumpet would sound tonight, buddy, I'd kick off these shoes if I had time, and I would, I would get to dancing in heaven. Come on, because that's what I'm living for. There is nothing here that we should be so consumed with that should want to keep us from being in his presence. Nothing. Let me tell you, if the trumpet sounds, and you say, well, I don't want to lose my grandkids. Guess what? Grandkids are going to. If they ain't made it to, to that certain age where they can make that decision, they're going to beat you, I bet. Come on. Hey, worried about it. That's the promise that we have. So he says in verse 2, Meanwhile, we groan and we long, or we're longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling because we know, he says, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. God's going to give us a beautiful, beautiful clothing or temple or what, however it is, he's going to provide it for us. God's got a place up there in store. So when he says the word meanwhile, talking about while we wait for the rapture, and then he goes in to verse 4. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed, but, we, but to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling. Church, if this is not your desire right now, I pray that God would change your desire. If your heart is on earthly things, you really need to have a serious talk with Jesus. You really, you really need to get serious about your relationship with him and say, Lord, you're more important to me than, than that house that I'm working on or that car that I just bought, or that, that, that new job that I just got, or that big bank account. Let me tell you, retirement funds won't even matter because you're not going to get to spend them. Are you hearing me? Does that mean we don't save or prepare? No, you, you, you do all you need to do because should the Lord tarry, you need everything you can. But there's a groaning inside of us that says, Lord, even so, come quickly. Lord, come. I'm desiring you. You know, I, I think back to my dad, and I, and I, uh, you know, last year when I'd ask him about, well, Dad, are you ready? <laughs> and he says, well, I'm really not ready, but I'm prepared. He says, because I, I, I'm enjoying And it wasn't that he didn't want to go be with the Lord, but he had his heart right. Church, if you've got your heart right, there's nothing to fear about. Can I hear it? Amen. If your soul is where it needs to be, 
If the trumpet sounds, come on. If you die on the way home, there's nothing to worry about. This old body, it passes away. God's got a new one. for You're going to be changed. It's like stepping into an elevator, and all of a sudden, boom, there you are. You got on the new garments. All the wrinkles are gone. Come on. Permanent press. I'm not sure about the hairdos yet. I don't know what God has. He said he knows the numbers of the hairs on your head. He doesn't have to keep up too hard with mine too much. <clears throat> For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling so that, listen to this, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. This body is going to be swallowed up. This body is going to pass away. A lot of people fear death. A lot of people are afraid of death. But death will come knock at their door whether they're ready or not. Some will go in their sleep. Some will go during the day. Some will go through accidents. Some, you just never know through injuries, through sickness, through pain, but God has something better for those who are there. Let's talk about that word swallowed up for just a minute. Those without Christ will be swallowed up by death. Those who are without Jesus are going to be swallowed up with death and there's no hope. But those who have received Jesus Christ as their Savior will be swallowed up by life. Because all of a sudden, what you thought was life here on this earth was nothing compared to the life that he has in store for us when we get to heaven. You think this is living? Come on. We're going to have a party when we get to heaven. Are you hearing me? There's going to be some rejoicing and shouting and singing going on. Those of you that haven't learned to sing and rejoice in church, you better start doing it. You need to get in practice. You need to get yourself in gear because there's going to be some singing going on. You think you're going to stand in heaven and do this? Forget it. You're going to worship the King of Kings. You're going to want to worship the Lord of Lords, the one who gave his very life for you. Come on, are you hearing me this evening? This is the time to practice. This is the time to lift your hands. This is the time to rejoice because when you get to heaven, it's going to be easy. You're already going to be warmed up. You're going to be tuned up to join that angel chorus. Come on. You won't be an angel, but you'll be a part of the, the angel chorus. Death has no hold on you if you're a Christian. Let me say it again. Death has no hold on you if you're a Christian. If you are worried about death, let me just invite you to get back on your face before the Lord and make sure. Because death, well, let me just take you a little farther. I'll, it'll explain it right here. Verse 5. Now, it is God who made us for this very purpose and has given us the Spirit as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. God gave you the Holy Spirit to guarantee what's to come. Are you hearing me? What is to come? What's to come? Eternity with Him. Come on. Those who have no hope their eternity is eternity in the lake of fire. Their eternity is a place of separation from God. But those who have Christ, their eternity is ever with him forever and ever and ever. There's something we're looking for. This deposit or guarantee, the deposit of the Holy Spirit into our, into our lives guarantees that we will be transformed into the likeness of Christ glorified body. That's what he's talking about. He says when you give your heart to God, you have a deposit of the Holy Spirit. 
When you got saved, Andrea, the Holy Spirit came into your life and he deposited him into you, guaranteeing that on the day that this body dies, you're going to be transformed into the image of his son in his glorified likeness. How many of you know when, when Jesus went up on the mountain of transfiguration, he appeared there before Peter, James, and John, and there were two others that came, Elijah and Moses. Elijah and Moses had not yet received their earthly body being, you know, it had, because the rapture hadn't took place, but they had a glorified body. So what I'm trying to tell you is when you leave this earth, all of a sudden you're being transformed into a glorified body that's going to take on the likeness of his son. What did they see? They saw three men. They saw Elijah, Moses, and Jesus. Jesus had took on that likeness in that moment, in that transfiguration. But remember, Jesus said, don't touch me. Not yet. It's not really happened all the way. Verse 6 says, Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. If you've never marked this in your Bible, and you don't mark your Bible, let me just tell you, it's time to mark your Bible. Draw a line under verse 6. You'll want to put something out to the side, even a star or whatever you want to put to remind you to be absent from the body is to be what? Present with the Lord. Come on. Therefore, we are confident and know that as long as we are at home in this body, we are away from the Lord. We're still looking for him. Does that mean we don't have Jesus with us today? No, the Holy Spirit reminds us of Jesus. He's there to be our comforter, our guide. You know, Jesus is in your heart. However, there's still that longing and so there's that desire. As long as we are at home in this body, we're absent from the Lord. We're, we're away from the Lord. Verse 7 says this, We live by faith, not by sight. You might want to underline that one too. How many of you sometimes you, you look at the circumstances and what you see in the natural eye and you start thinking, there's no way this can happen. If I die, everything's lost. I'm here to tell you, I live by faith. If I die, everything is gained. If I die, I've got what I've been living for. I've got what God's promised me. Verse 8 says, for we are confident, and I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. How many of you understand what he's saying? When I leave this old earthly tent here, I'm transformed. I'm changed. I'm in his image. I've been changed. Paul put it this way when he wrote to the church at Philippi. He said this in chapter 1 and verse 21. He says, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Can you hear me? For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in this body, this will be meaningful, or this will be fruitful labor for me. Yet, what shall I choose? I do not know. He's asking himself these questions. Verse 23, he says, I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Paul knew that as long as God had him there, he had a ministry to fulfill. He had a purpose. He had, he had things that he had to accomplish. But the moment that his life was over, that's what he was living for. That's all that he was working for. So verse 9 says, so we make it our goal to please him. How many of you make it your goal to please the Lord every day? I've said this hundreds of times, I'm sure, over the years. But one of my prayers every day, Lord, help me to be the man of God you want me to be. If there's anything in my life that needs to change, help me to change it. Purify me, oh God. Help me to do what's right. I know I'm a human. I'm perfect, and I, I, I'm not perfect. <laughs> Let me say that again. I know I'm human and I'm not perfect. 
I make mistakes. You just heard one. <laughs> I are one sometimes. <laughs> but I realize that with God's help, I can do it. So Paul tells the church at Corinth, so we make it our goal to please him. We're not trying to please everybody else. We're pleasing him, whether we're at home in this body or away from it in your presence. And we'll close with this script, this one passage, chapter 10, but, or verse 10. But I got several references I'm going to give you, so don't get anxious. I'll only keep you another 30 minutes or an hour. Didn't even get a rise out of you. Verse 10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Can you see that verse? We must all appear before the judgment seat. Did it say some of us would appear before the judgment seat of Christ? What is it? All. All of us will appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Does he talking about the Christians? Well, he wrote this letter to the church. He's talking to the Christians. Every believer and every unbeliever will all go before the judgment seat of Christ. Several weeks back, we started this series, and we just finished it up on Sunday night, Driven by Eternity. That whole series, as I was reading this passage, I'm thinking, this is the key right here. Look at this. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Everything that we do is accounted for. Everything that we do, there's records being kept in heaven. Some of you, you say, well, pastor, I've asked the Lord to forgive me. I'm not talking about salvation here. And that's not what John Bevere was talking about. He's talking about what are you doing with the time that God has given you now. Paul says, as long as I'm in this body, I need to give everything I can to God. I need to commit my ways to him, my efforts to him. I need to put him first. I need to give everything I can to win souls for the kingdom of God. How many of you know we are storing up riches in heaven for eternity? Everybody's going to face the judgment. Revelations 20, in chapter 20, in verses 11 through 15, I'm not going to read it all to you, but John records this as Jesus speaks, and he tells of the great white throne judgment. And this is when all the dead will be judged for what they have done, good or bad. There will be a judgment seat. This is where Christ will sit there and will see the good and the bad. Those whose names are found, or those whose names are not found written in the book of life will be thrown into the lake of fire. How many of you want to make sure your name's there? Amen. Romans 14, 12 says, each of us will give an account of himself to God. In 1 Corinthians, going back into our last passages there, in first chapter 3 and verse 11, Paul said it this way, and this one you need to listen to real closely. For no one can lay a foundation other than the one has already been laid on Jesus, uh, which is Jesus Christ. How many of you know there's no other foundation other than Jesus? He is the chief cornerstone. Everything that we stand on is Jesus. He says in verse 12, If any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, straw, his work will be shown for what it is. Because the day will, be, will bring it to light, and it will be revealed with fire. And the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. He's talking to the church now. If what we have built survives, 
you will receive your reward. So the good things you've done, you people you've won to the Lord, the people you've led to Christ, people that you've helped out, people that you've blessed and ministered to, those things, there's rewards. That's the gold, the silver, you know, the precious stones. The things that we've done other than that that are the wood, hay, and stubble, guess what happens when fire hits them? They don't last. They're gone. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it is burned up, he will suffer the loss. Listen to this, last part. But he himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. Let me just say, when you get to heaven, and, and if, you, if you listen to this story, you'll understand if you go back and hear the story that John Bevere did on Aphabel where he talks about how everybody got the reward for the way they lived when they got into the, the, before the king. One day we'll stand before the king and we'll be accountable. We know that salvation is by faith in Christ through grace. It's not by works. Works will not get you there. Only salvation by faith in Christ Jesus will get you there. However, once you've given your heart to Christ, it's what we do that we will store up the riches and the rewards that we will be honored with when we're in heaven. Some people are saying, I'm just going to be glad to be there. Let me say, what greater honor would it be to be there and to see the lives that you have touched, the people that you have affected? I'm, I'm here to tell you, uh, Sunday night was probably one of the most powerful nights. Wasn't the most, but it was one of the most powerful nights in that series as he talks about our influence on other people. Church, I want you to know those that you influence for the kingdom of God, you're going to get rewards for. Those that you have influenced to serve Christ and give their hearts to the Lord, cha-ching, 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 cha-ching. If all you're concerned about here on this earth is, I got my heart right with God, I'm living okay, but I'm going to let everybody else do everything else, watch out. You're going you're gonna to be missing out when we get to heaven. God has great things in store for you. Let's work while we can. Can I hear it? Amen. Jesus made this statement. He says, work while it is day because night is coming. We started the beginning of this chapter today talking about this earthly tent, knowing that one day we are going to retire this old body. I look at some of the blemishes, the scars. Anybody got any scars? When I get to heaven... There'll be no imperfections, be no scars, because he's going to make me like his son. Church, that's what we need to be striving for now, to be like him. Stand with me, and I'll close in a word of prayer. Holy Spirit, tonight, I thank you for the word. I pray that tonight, Lord, as we have looked at your word that, God, you would cause it to come alive into our hearts and lives. Lord, that we might bring glory and honor unto you. And, God, I pray that you will help us, Lord, as we moan and we groan in this old tent. Lord, as we long for the day that you will call us to be with you. Lord, that we'll be faithful to what you've called us to do until the day that we're home with you. Lord, that we can be busy about the Father's business. Have your way in our lives. Help us to be the men and women of God that you want us to be, I pray. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. God bless you.